Hello everyone and welcome. We're going to wait just a moment to let a few more people join us. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, this is Joanne Gear. I'm the Executive Director of the Biopharma Research Council. We are an association for scientists across all of the silos of biomedical research. Uh, our whole mission is to help researchers speak with each other, to learn about what each other is doing, and to potentially apply cross-functional knowledge and develop collaborations. We're, we've got some really interesting programs coming up. Uh, at the end of July, we're doing a program called the Internet of Medical Things, which is on cybersecurity and discovery development and devices. That's going to be in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, in August, at the old Bell Labs, where they invented the transistor, we're doing a day-long program. This is August 12, called Data, Drugs, and Diagnostics, which, as it sounds, will take a look at the really the data revolution that we're living in and what's cutting-edge work in generation, collection, an analysis, sharing, and storage of uh, data to develop drugs and diagnostics. Um, we just uh, finished in April, we had a really wonderful uh, short course in the microbiome, which is uh, all on our website if you'd like to see those recordings. And then in September, now this is not, registration isn't up yet, but uh, September 24th, uh, save the date, um, you will see that we're having a program at the NIH in Frederick, Maryland on manipulating the microbiome. We do a lot of our programs three, uh, through webinars such as this, and uh, we get a lot of great ideas from people like you who listen to our sessions. So please feel free to be in touch with us if you have an idea for something you'd like to hear, you'd like to present. We have a lot of great uh, programs because of that interaction. Um, I just wanted to say before I um, uh, share with you introductions to our wonderful speakers today, uh, two things. One is that you have a question box on the right-hand side of your dashboard, and you can enter questions at any time throughout the program. We will take the questions after Dr. Keeney is finished with his uh, presentation. Um, and the other thing is we're going to do a very short poll. We're putting you on the spot here. Let's see if I can launch this. And here we go. So if you could answer this question, that will help us to let our speakers know something about our audience. Are you currently working with Venom in your work? Okay. Terrific. Good. I'm going to close the poll, and as you can see, we have 31% of people who say they're not working with Venom yet, but they're interested. 8% saying they're not, but they might soon. Nobody says yes, just getting started. And 62% say yes, I've been at it for a while. So that's terrific. Okay. Um, I'm going to introduce our speakers today, and I have to say I, I so appreciate the generosity of uh, presenters from all over the world who have helped us with these educational programs. Uh, our primary speaker today is Dr. Madrinata Kini, who is a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at the National University of Singapore. He is editor-in-chief of Toxin Reviews and serves on editorial boards of several international journals. He has been the chairman and co-chairman of the Subcommittee on Exogenous Factors International Society of, on Thrombosis and Hemostasis since 1998. He is a member of the Executive Council of International Society on Toxinology. He has published more than 210 original research papers, reviews, and book chapters, and edited five special issues and two books. One is Venom uh, Phospholipase uh, A2 Enzyme, Structure, Function, and Mechanism. The other is Toxins and Homostasis from Bench to Bedside. He has 36 patent applications and has started three small biotechnology companies. 
uh, Dr. David Fritzinger of Fritzinger Biopharma Consulting uh, was previously an associate professor at the University of Hawaii Cancer Center, where he performed structure function studies on human complement C3. While at the University of Hawaii Cancer Center, he co-founded the biotech startup Encode Biopharmaceutics based on the intellectual property from his laboratory. Previous to that, and he was the director of the DNA sequencing and genotyping core at Myriad Genetics, and I'm very proud to say he is a member of our scientific advisory board. I just want to thank everyone for coming. Again, please enter questions through the box on the right at any time during the program, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Keeney. Thank you very much, Joanne. Uh, I'd like to uh, introduce you today to Venom Components in uh, Designing Therapeutics, and today particularly I'll be focusing mostly on snake venoms as a source of novel drug leads. As you are familiar, uh, venomous animals are found in very different phyla. Every phyla uh, you will have uh, examples of venomous animals and all these uh, venoms will be uh, useful and can be used for identifying uh, drug prototypes. Uh, our lab has been, uh, has been working on uh, uh, reptiles which I've shown you in blue, uh, mostly uh, in uh, snakes, snake venoms. And we have also worked on fish venoms, cone snail venoms, and among arachnids, we have worked on scorpions, spiders, and ticks. Today, I'm going to talk to uh, you in terms of uh, snake venoms. And uh, snakes have fascinated me uh, since my childhood, and snakes have, of course, fascinated uh, uh, people, humans, uh, since uh, prehistoric times. There is a mystery about snakes. Uh, snakes have slimy appearance. Although they look slimy, uh, when you touch them, they are very leathery. And of course, unusual thing about snakes is they are limbless. And that makes it difficult for us to understand because of their strange ability to move so fast. We are familiar with uh, animals with two legs, four legs, six, eight, and of course, hundreds of legs in centipedes and millipedes, and you can easily understand how they move. But when you think of, imagine uh, animals which are limbless, it is uh, difficult to uh, comprehend how they move. And uh, generally, all the animals move from point A to point B in a straight line. But snakes, as, you're, as you know, they move in a uh, very unusual movement. It's a serpentine movement. Of course, sometimes humans also do this when they're really drunk. And uh, <laughs> it's the fear of the unknown <laughs> which <laughs> makes it uh, uh, difficult for us to understand, and that's what fascinates us. More than their movement and the uh, appearance, it's the deadly venoms they have, which makes it uh, really difficult for us to un uh, understand how they might interact with their uh, surrounding. And of course, if you are in the surrounding of the snakes, you are worried about your safety. Only about 20% of snakes are venomous, and these uh, uh, venomous snakes have been grouped uh, under five different uh, families. Uh, Elapidae, which contains cobras, crates, and mambas. Hydrophidae, these are all uh, sea snakes. And uh, Viperidae contains all the vipers. And Crotalidae has the rattlesnakes, copperheads, and cottonmouths. And there's a huge, about 75% of these uh, venomous animals are grouped under colubridae. These are snakes uh, which are uh, polyphyletic, uh, and um, these uh, snakes have very little venom. So they are not necessarily dangerous to humans. However, there are uh, a small number of species uh, that do cause uh, human animation and death. So in overall, about 25% of the 20% of snake species that means only 5% of the uh, snake species are deadly or dangerous to uh, humans. The venom uh, in snakes have evolved so that the snakes can catch their prey. In this picture, you see the snake is right behind a cute little bird. 
but this lively animal is converted into a dead animal by a single bite in a very short time, in a few minutes. And this, uh, well, these toxins have evolved to target two key systems. One is nervous system or neuromuscular system where it can uh, immobilize the uh, animal very quickly and uh, it also targets circulatory system or the cardiovascular system affecting all parts of all aspects of uh, cardiovascular system. When you shut off these two systems, animal can go from life to death in just a few minutes. So thus, there are toxins which target neuromuscular system. Let me introduce you a little bit to the toxins in uh, snake venom. The picture here uh, shows you a uh, nerve terminal and its junction with the uh, muscle. And the picture actually depicts uh, acetylcholine transmission. So in snake venom, you have toxins which affect on the postsynaptic side. These are uh, classically named as alpha neurotoxins. And uh, these affect the neuromuscular junction at the postsynaptic side of the transmission. And there are a number of toxins which affect on the presynaptic side. These we call presynaptic neurotoxins or beta neurotoxins. Generally, these uh, neurotoxins contain phospholipase A2 as an integral component of this uh, uh, neurotoxin. In addition to these, there are myotoxins which are also phospholipase A2 and there are some non-enzymatic myotoxins that target directly the muscle. In this picture, what I'm showing you is toxins affect all sides of the neuromuscular junction. This is the same thing if you look at the uh, blood coagulation cascade. In the picture, I show you the blood coagulation cascade, very simplified version of it, where Zymogens are converted to uh, you know, active enzymes and in a cascade fashion and you end up with a blood coagulation, uh, blood clot. In this system, the snake enzymes, which I'm showing you now in green, these are all procoagulant enzymes. These activate uh, blood coagulation cascade and different parts of the cascade and initiate the clotting. These are they initiate clotting so they are procoagulant. But there are a number of enzymes which also interfere in the clot stability and also they break down the uh, enzymes which are important in controlling the uh, cascade. So what they do is they'll exhibit kind of anticoagulant function. In addition to these, there are a number of anticoagulant proteins. The one in blue, these are phospholipase A2, they affect two different uh, coagulation complexes uh, and uh, it's very interesting they do block uh, uh, the coagulation from continuing so they are anticoagulant in function and the ones I've shown you in yellow boxes these are uh, all uh, non-enzymatic proteins and as you can see they stop the blood from uh, clotting at different parts of the coagulation cascade. Uh, as I shown in the previous slide uh, where the toxins would affect different uh, parts of the uh, neuromuscular junction. You can see in this slide, the snake venom toxins affect different parts of the coagulation cascade. So this is also true in blood uh, platelet aggregation. And uh, in this slide, I show all the receptors and ligands which are important in the coagulation cascade, uh, platelet aggregation. And uh, there are all sorts of inhibitors and activators, some enzymes, some non-enzymatic proteins, which exhibit anti-platelet uh, and uh, pro-platelet uh, function. So from these three uh, slides, what I've been able to demonstrate to you, snake toxins affect almost every aspect or every part of the system in both uh, uh, cardiovascular, uh, I didn't show you much about the other vasodilators and the heart, but all the blood coagulation and uh, platelet aggregation as well as in the neuromuscular junction. So this has made people think about how do we first sort out the uh, toxicity issue. So people have been working uh, in the field of venoms and toxins trying to develop antidotes which can resolve toxicity so that uh, they can uh, protect their uh, 
uh, relatives and friends as well as uh, sort out the problems in neutralizing pathological symptoms. These antidotes generally are called antivenoms. These antivenoms are antibodies developed in horses and goats. And uh, in general, majority of the snake bite problems have been taken care of, except in some parts of the world there are still issues and difficulties in obtaining good quality antidotes and there are still close to about 100, 150,000 people die every year due to snake bite. But this paradigm has shifted a little bit over the years. People have been using uh, snake venoms as research tool, diagnostic agents, and pharmaceutical uh, prototypes. Let me give you some examples of research tools which have been uh, used. I'm going to focus on these three, and research tools which have been used. I'm just going to give you three examples. The first one is alpha bungara toxin isolated from bungarus multisynctus, which was uh, isolated in the uh, uh, 60s, uh, and it was used to identify and isolate the uh, receptor for uh, acetylcholine. And nicotinic acetylcholine receptor was li literally isolated and used for characterization, and it's the best characterized receptor we know. And this was possible because of alpha bungara toxin as well as very concentrated sources in electric eel. So it helped us to understand neurotransmission as we speak. And the second example is botrocetin from both of the species. And this was studied in the US by uh, uh, Ken um, in, in North Carolina. He uh, used this to understand Van Willebrand factor uh, interaction and in platelet aggregation. And this was uh, currently used in many diagnostics as well as understanding platelet aggregation. Of course, the third example is a nerve growth factor. This was uh, identified uh, serendipitously by Rita Montalcini, who got the Nobel Prize for her studies on nerve growth factor. And this factor was the uh, first factor they could isolate in really the large quantities so that they could understand how uh, growth factors function. So this molecule has helped in understanding cell growth regulation and it's kind, kind, uh, used as a tool in understanding various diseases and problems uh, due to uh, cell growth uh, inhibition or uh, processes in cell growth. So now if you look at the diagnostic agents, uh, botrocetin, batroxabin, and several of these uh, uh, factors, these are uh, snake venom factors which are used in uh, diagnostic, uh, as diagnostic agents in a number of uh, uh, diseases, and these are in uh, the uh, diagnostic agents used in hematology alone. There are, of course, diagnostic agents which are useful in uh, identifying problems in uh, nervous system and so on and so forth. Now, if you look at therapeutic prototypes, and these are already the drugs which are in the in, in the market. The first one is uh, uh, enalapril, captopril and capotin, which has been used as an angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitor. This was first isolated and developed from a, a peptide called bradykinin-potentiating peptide, isolated from Brazilian uh, rattlesnake uh, uh, Botrops jararaca. And this was isolated by uh, Sergei uh, Fernandes. It was uh, one of the first drugs which changed the paradigm uh, uh, completely from toxin and started the new wave of toxins to therapeutic. This drug is in the market for about 25, 30 years or longer and probably has saved lives of hundreds of millions of people. And if you look at the second one, eptifibatide and tirofibon, third one, uh, tirofibon, both of them were developed based on a protein called disintegrin isolated from uh, two different vipers. Cicerus barburi and Echis carinatus. So these two are used in uh, open heart surgeries and uh, PCI uh, in uh, heart uh, ailments. And if you look at several others in the pipeline, 
there is batroxabine, there is uh, natriuretic peptides, and uh, C-typelectin, which is uh, in different uh, treatment, and uh, they are being developed as we speak. Venoms, of course, have to be first extracted, and this extraction process is called milking. And this is uh, done in uh, wipers, which have very long fangs, as you can see in the first two slides of uh, two panels. And these uh, fangs are very long and foldable, and they're easy to be used for milking. As you can see in the top uh, panel, uh, you use the uh, goblet and make it bite the goblet, and it's easy to milk them. But in uh, cobras and crates, the fangs are short and very small, and uh, they're at the front end of the mouth, and uh, they're milked through a, a goblet which is covered with a diaphragm. But there are a number of other snakes which I talked to you about colubrids, and these have uh, fangs in the back of the mouth, and as you can see in the bottom of the uh, bottom left-hand corner, uh, the fangs are in the back. And you can show it, you know, it's been shown in the middle panel. And in these cases, we inject pilocarpine, and the venom would ooze out, and it's uh, used, uh, you know, piped it out from the mouth of the snake. And uh, this is how people collect the venom, and this is traditional method. My method is uh, unfortunately or fortunately different. I use uh, this call 1-800 number and send an email to a friend, and magically, in about two weeks, I get this freeze-dried venom, and these are the <laughs> venoms I would get. And you, as you can see, they come in small vials uh, as a freeze-dried powder. Once we get this powder, what we do is we look for novel toxins in the lab, and as you can see in the bottom of the uh, car, left-hand side, you'll see snake venom is a mixture of uh, 50 to 100 different proteins, sometimes even more than that, and we isolate the protein of interest, the new toxins from there, using chromatographic methods, and we follow either the structure of the protein or the biological activity of the protein. We also use uh, other approaches such as proteomics approach, our cDNA library, transcriptome, and genomes. And uh, using uh, next-gen sequencing, we identify new protein. Once you identify the proteins using these approaches, we have to clone them and express them if the protein is large. If the protein is smaller, we use solid phase peptide synthesis, and we fold this protein and to reach uh, new toxins. When I say new toxin, I want to study toxins which have never, ever been characterized. We would like to use these toxins uh, uh, which are unusual uh, and they have they are isolated from uh, rare snakes. Once you have this new toxin, we determine their three-dimensional structure. We do uh, structure using both NMR and X-ray crystallography. And when the toxin is new, you also want to understand their function. And to do that, we inject into the whole animal. And based on the symptoms of the animal, we start looking at what kind of organ systems they would target, and we go systematically to uh, understand in organ bath or in tissue culture, tissue modes, we'll start seeing where does it uh, affect. <coughs> and finally, we use uh, uh, biophysical techniques to understand the mechanism, trying to uh, locate exactly the receptor or the ion channel to which this toxin would bind, and uh, show its function. Just to give you a, an idea of uh, how our process is, we have purified probably close to about 500 or more uh, toxins, and over the years we have sequenced and looked at the sequences of a uh, few uh, thousand uh, snake venom toxins. However, we, our lab has been working on about 35, 40 different toxins. And we have completed the structures, three-dimensional structures of about 25, 30 different toxins. And we have identified the function of about 30 toxins. And uh, we know the exact receptor or ion channel of about 20 uh, different toxins. When you complete this, you know the target protein and the toxin would bind uh, to this target prote protein, which can be a receptor or ion channel, to a small uh, surface region. Uh, of the toxin. 
and we would like to identify this functional site and we do that through structure function relationship. We use site directed mutagenesis, we do solid phase peptides in a synth uh, synthetic peptide to identify this functional site. Once you identify this functional site, this site is sufficient to recognize the target receptor or ion channel and exhibit its function. So we make short peptides based on this functional site. Of course, sometimes these functional sites do not have the same conformation as the uh, original toxin. In such a case, what we do is we take that uh, functional site and use protein design and engineering methods to put it on the molecular scaffold, which is a mini protein disulfide bonded uh, domain. We use that, which is most appropriate for uh, exposing or exhibiting this functional site on its surface and retain the same conformation or close to the same conformation as the toxin. In this area, in the top area of understanding structure function relationship, we are fairly strong. However, in protein design and engineering, uh, as with uh, many people in the world, we are also learning how to do, do this protein folding and design. But in understanding a little bit of molecular scaffold, we have, been, we have made some significant uh, progress in recent years. Just to give you some idea why we have to do this functional site and dissect out the functional site is uh, if you look at uh, some toxins, toxins have a toxic site and a beneficial site. We want to generate a peptide with only the beneficial site. Just to give you some examples, uh, from my lab, the one in the left-hand top corner, uh, you see calciceptin, it's a toxin isolated from mamba venom, and this is a specific uh, toxin which uh, blocks L-type calcium channel current. It does not touch N-type, T-type, P-type, Q-type calcium channels. We identify the uh, red uh, colored segment, and this segment, uh, based on this functional site, we have made an eight amino acid residue peptide, which binds specifically to L-type calcium channel, and uh, it does block L-type calcium channel. And if you look at the uh, green peptides in the uh, acanthin, these are anti-platelet peptides. The white peptide is used, white segment is used to design anticoagulant peptide, and the analgesic uh, peptide shown in red in analgesin we have developed. Basically, our idea is to develop from toxins to therapeutics. So it's uh, search for new toxin is like looking for the needle in the haystack, and everyone knows venoms are good sources of uh, toxin, but when a student walks in, a student's view is it's easy to get this needle. But the reality is that both the supervisor and the student is blindfolded and they have to go through the entire stash to identify this uh, new lead. So the girl in uh, brown sweater has found the needle and that's why she's smiling. Venoms are interesting because uh, they do contain uh, bioactive molecules in large quantities. If you look at the neurons, muscle cells, and uh, uh, liver cells, you have less than 0.25% which are bioactive out of the 4,000 proteins found in these uh, cells. But if you look at the venoms, uh, you can find more than 90% of these uh, proteins are bioactive. So they make a rich source of bioactive compounds. So needles are much easier to find. In our lab, we have seen a number of these new toxins this list gives you an idea. In our lab alone, in the last uh, 15, 20 years, we have been able to discover close to about 30 new toxins. And uh, some of the potential therapeutics, which uh, I'm going to uh, briefly talk about, uh, this is, I'm going to talk about the analgesic uh, from King Cobra Venom, and uh, I'm not going to today talk to you about beta cardiotoxin, uh, which is a very specific inhibitor of beta adrenergic receptor. And we have also, uh, I'm going to talk to you about Bungarus uh, fasciitis factor 11A inhibitor. And uh, I'm not going to talk to you about the two examples in the bottom of the screen, 
uh, it's a L-type calcium channel blocker from uh, mom, black mamba venom and I'm also not going to talk to you about natriuretic peptide analogs uh, uh, from crate venom. The only thing I would like to tell about natriuretic peptide analogs is we have designed analogs which would have purely vasoactive function without uh, diuresis and we have also developed an analog which has uh, uh, potent uh, diuresis but no uh, vasodilation. And we have also designed natriuretic peptide analogs which have much, half, uh, much longer half-life. So just to give you an idea about prohanin, the uh, potent analgesic peptide, this is uh, uh, designed based on the three-finger toxin from King Cobra Venom and we have uh, made from 65 residues to 11 residue uh, uh, peptide and it's, uh, the parent is neurotoxic whereas the peptide is non-neurotoxic. This is an example where we have removed the toxicity from the molecule. And uh, this peptide is uh, more potent than morphine in uh, rodent pain models and it uh, unfortunately does not have uh, effect on neuropathic pain and uh, the tail flick models. And the uh, route of administration uh, is through, uh, it can be administered through sublingually and orally and also works through intraperitoneal, intramuscular and uh, subcutaneous routes of administration. It uh, acts through uh, L-name pathway and uh, 7NI inhibits this and telling us it goes through neuronal nitric oxide synthase and it does not exhibit any function in uh, NNOS knockout mice. And we have also shown that it binds to neuronal nitric oxide synthase. What we have done also is uh, in-house in toxicity and side effects profile and the uh, peptide does not exhibit any uh, side effects or toxicity up to 2,000 times its effective dose. Currently, we are trying to get into preclinical toxicology studies. If you look at fasciator, it's the first exogenous factor 11A inhibitor. It's a Kunitz type serine protease inhibitor uh, designed uh, from, uh, isolated from crate venom. The crate venom protein is a specific inhibitor of factor 11A with a Ki of 1.5 uh, nanometer, uh, uh, 1.5 micromolar. And this work was carried out by uh, my graduate student Chen Wan and two of my collaborators uh, Kang Seixiang and Mark Chan are uh, shown in this picture. And uh, this using systematic site directed mutagenesis we made a created a double mutant uh, which is highly potent and selective. Now we have uh, uh, increased the potency by about thousand fold and it binds to factor 11a with 0.86 nanom nanomolar. What we have done is we have exposed the uh, carotid artery in the mouse and there is a Doppler flow probe which is put on this right carotid artery and we put uh, initiate the uh, thrombosis using ferric chloride soaked filter paper and as you can see after some time blood flow stops come to an heart and this part is called time for occlusion and we have tested this in the uh, animals and in the control the uh, occlusion is uh, about uh, five to seven minutes in the tap panel and uh, you can see with the in, the in the presence of fasciator mutant you can see it has gone up quite significantly and when you uh, reduce the uh, ferric chloride concentration in the, as shown in the black, uh, uh, bottom panel the cl clotting time, the thrombosis time, time for occlusion goes up a little bit and in these cases the fasciator treated uh, uh, mouse does not show any uh, uh, thrombosis at all. And we have also developed uh, from uh, other sources potential uh, uh, effects. So I'm going to just briefly mention we have antithrombotic peptide designed based on thrombin inhibitor from the ticks and we also have anti-angiogenic peptides uh, from humans, angiostatin and endostatin. And when we are talking about uh, uh, drugs, we, our snake venoms and toxins are also useful 
and targeted drug delivery, the molecule I'm talking about is candaxin isolated from a malign crate venom. Uh, it was uh, the work done by uh, Nirdhanan, who is at the top of the uh, panel, right-hand corner, and supported by Gopal and Daniel Bertrand. And uh, this is a reversible blocker of peripheral nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, and it's an irreversible blocker of neuronal alpha-7 uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. It's highly specific for glial cells, and based on the functional site of it, as you can see, the peptide does bind, uh, uh, the peptide called CDX binds uh, to alpha-7 at 187 nanomolar concentration. What uh, they have done is they have put the CDX to a PEG PLA micelle, and uh, this micelle contains the drug paclitaxel, which is an anti-tumor drug, and uh, the other uh, control peptide is unlabeled, which is uh, labeled with M, and these are injected separately to mice-bearing glioblastoma. As you can see in the slide, the ones which, is, which are injected with CDS lab labeled peptide survive much longer just to demonstrate that it indeed does carry the drug to the uh, brain, they have used the unlabeled and labeled vesicles. Now they are filled with uh, fluorescent dye. And in each of these panel on the right side, you see the uh, uh, animals injected with the CDX containing vesicles, and you see more and more drug is going to reach the brain. So basically, candoxin helps in designing magic bullets which can take the drug to the brain. There are also a number of toxins which can be used for designing magic bullets for other tissues. And uh, just to give you an idea of challenges in venom research, there is a functional diversity among closely related proteins. In this slide, you see three-finger toxins, which all look similar. We call them sibling toxins, but they have different biological properties because they go to different target uh, receptors and ion channels. And if you look at their functional site, which I've shown in red in this slide, these sites are very on different parts of the molecule, and it's very difficult to guess where the functional sites are. So it makes uh, studying uh, uh, individual uh, sibling toxins difficult and challenging. So if you look at uh, sibling toxins, High structural similarity does not ensure functional identity. It's like monkey versus man. And although they are 98% similar, they are distinct from man. So if you look at functional sites of the sibling toxins, they are on different surfaces, and thus each toxin is a new challenge. So if you look at sibling toxins, there are multiple toxins found in different venoms, and uh, this is because of severe gene duplication and accelerated evolution of exons. So these, both these processes, processes are very interesting, although the mechanisms are unknown. But if we do understand these mechanisms, I'm sure we'll be able to create a very interesting bunch of uh, cocktail of uh, new toxins and design and develop new uh, therapeutic agents. If you look at the, fun, uh, the second aspect of challenge is functional convergence among structurally unrelated proteins. And these are all look different, but they all have the same potassium channel toxin function. And that's because they have a functional dyad, which is an aromatic residue and a positively charged residue, which is separated by just six Armstrong. All of these uh, tell you it makes it very interesting in understanding structure function relationships. It's very intriguing and challenging. It also helps us uh, understand protein chemistry and protein science. Over the years, uh, we have learned several lessons. We have been able to identify common cytolytic region in proteins and the importance of hydrophobic and cationic segments. We have been able to identify common structural feature in flanking segment, structural role of uh, proline residues, and this has helped us identify uh, and develop methods to identify protein-protein interaction sites directly from the amino acid sequence of a new protein and also design potent bioactive peptides. And we have also been able to understand structural determinants in protein folding, for example, how they would help in disulfide pairing in small uh, mini uh, domains, such as conotoxin and epidermal growth uh, factor domains. So 
why snake venom research is more fascinating is because they are structurally similar to human proteins. So if you look in this picture, the human uh, pancreatic phospholipase or bovine pancreatic phospholipase looks very similar to uh, human protein. This is not the enzyme only protein which looks like this. There are a number of these proteins which I've shown on the left side in red are toxins and the right side are the proteins which are structurally very similar. So structurally similar proteins but the proteins in the uh, mammalian system do mostly mundane uh, activities whereas uh, proteins in the venom can have exciting functions. So it is interesting to understand evolution of these toxins, their origin, their duplication and rapid evolution. So it's basic and applied science in one. So just to conclude the, about the fascinating future, venoms are veritable gold mines um, of uh, bioactive molecules. There are new toxins and exciting families and there are new families of toxins. There are new challenges in structure, function and mechanism of action. So many venoms, so little time. With this, I'd like to uh, conclude my talk. I'd like to thank you all for your patient listening. Thank you very much. Joanne? Well, thank you, Dr. Keeney. That was fantastic. Um, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Fritzinger to join us now. If you'd like to unmute yourself and if you yep. have any initial conversation. And I have a few questions from the audience, and I encourage everyone to enter your questions in the question box at the right. Okay, I have one question. Uh, obviously, everything you talked about was small molecules in venom. What about larger proteins? Do yeah, there are also, yeah, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, uh, no, go ahead. I. Yeah, so there are, of course, obviously larger proteins. I mean, we have been focusing on uh, uh, molecules which are uh, 10 to 15 kilodalton and lower. And, of course, uh, there are uh, large molecules which are being used to design and develop uh, therape uh, therapeutic agents. Uh, the one example comes to my mind is uh, cobra venom factor, which is a very important molecule which has been uh, kind of uh, made, humanized to put in humans to uh, combat number of uh, immune response uh, issues. And there are also uh, large molecules such as metal or protease. And uh, I did uh, mention about batroxabin. And these are things which are used in various aspects of uh, treatment. For example, metalloprotease is used in, as a clot buster. And uh, in uh, case of batroxabin, it's used as uh, uh, making blood uh, not clot uh, for some time. So in some cases, you do not want the blood to clot. So these processes, they deep fibrogenate the blood using batroxamine. Well, thank you. Thank you for mentioning cold venom factor. I've been working on that for years. <laughs> <laughs> Did, would you like to chat about that briefly, uh, Dr. Fritzinger? Oh, uh, well, I mean, he, he, he mentioned the, um, the humanization, and that's something that was done in my lab for a number of years, and uh, we've had some pretty good results. but. That will be get talked about at another time, I hope. Good. We'll look forward to that. Um, I have uh, some questions from the audience. I'll read a few now. I'll start with one. Um, have researchers in this field started using CRISPR-Cas9 to engineer venoms, for example, for delivery, potency, or specificity? Well, uh, uh, CRISPR is an interesting technology. Generally, the CRISPR technology is used to manipulate transgenic animals and things like that. And we have not gone into transgenic snakes. Of course, obviously, once we understand some, some aspects of uh, uh, you know, gene duplication and accelerated evolution, we may be in a position to make transgenic uh, snakes so that the snakes themselves do that. But generally, we tr tend not to go into transgenic snakes because of their very long uh, periods of uh, gestation and uh, growth and, you know, the F1 and F2 generation. So generally, uh, CRISPR technology has not been used, uh, uh, I should say, in, in uh, venom research at this point. 
Thank you. Um, could you comment on how the FDA might classify and review a snake venom filing? Well, uh, my thinking at this point is uh, although it comes from the snake venom, the way we are proceeding in making just a functional site, the shot peptide is not, uh, we are not isolating from the venom anymore, but rather uh, make them uh, synthetically using uh, solid phase peptide synthesis and it would be like any other biologic, you have a, a, a short peptide or a short a small domain which would be devoid of any uh, side effects or things and uh, similar to other biologics and probably small molecules, we have to go through the same kind of uh, admitox studies where you would look at the uh, side effects and toxicity in two distinct uh, species uh, of uh, uh, animals, one of them being a non-rodent uh, primate, non-rodent uh, mammal, I think, you know, depending on the application they might want us to do something in uh, non-primate, uh, no sorry, non-rodent primates. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see, this is a question from Brazil. Uh, yeah. For therapeutic purposes, do you believe that venom toxins can be used in native form or some specific formulation should be prepared? Thanks and congratulations for this talk. <laughs> it's an interesting question. I mean, obvious uh, thing is the toxicity and uh, if uh, the particular toxin in question is non-toxic, there are some components, they may not exhibit toxicity or side effects except it goes to the right point. As long as it has that compartmentalization and it goes to the right spot and uh, you don't have uh, any side effects, it should not be a, a problem. For example, uh, uh, which com comes to my mind is Botox, you know, uh, botulinum toxin which is uh, used now as Botox injections directly uh, without uh, any modification or very little modification to be uh, injected in, uh, uh, in removing, uh, uh, you know, problems uh, in terms of involuntary ticks and uh, um, people are uh, in uh, making people beautiful with removing the wrinkles. So uh, I guess it can be used directly but Sometimes you may need to have formulations to either make it slow delivery or uh, sl slow release kind of things and that is possible. Thank you. Um, we have several congratulations here on a great talk and I will, and we have a question, I will say that uh, we are recording this session. It will be on our website within a day or so and we'll be sending out a notice to everyone and please feel free to share it with your colleagues. Here's another question. Have venoms been considered for treating other proteinaceous clots like plaques in brains? At this point, to my knowledge, it has not been used in uh, breaking the, uh, uh, you know, the neuro neurological uh, flax in uh, ne ne neurological disorders such as uh, Alzheimer's and things. Uh, mainly because the, the um, problem there is uh, mostly uh, because of the conversion of alpha helical uh, prototype, you know, uh, protomers into a beta sheeted form after cleavage and unless you dissolve this by specific action, for that you need something to target right there and at this point I have not come across a toxin which targets so specifically to this uh, small uh, aggregation of beta sheeted proteins in the brain. Uh, if there is a toxin which could go there, I think it's possible to develop such a molecule for specific treatment of neurological disorders. As a follow-up, would there be a problem with the uh, toxin crossing the uh, blood-brain barrier? Not all toxins do cross blood-brain barrier, but some do have uh, capability. I mean, uh, this is uh, related to compartmentalization 
and when you think you do not want it to cross the blood-brain barrier, you need to come up with strategies to keep them in the peripheral system or, uh, you know, um, that is possible to design things like that. But in cases where you want it to be in the CNS but not in the systemic exposure, there also there are strategies where you could make it appear only in the CNS but not in the systemic exposure. One example uh, I can give you is of ziconotide, which is a, a N-type calcium channel blocker isolated from uh, conus venoms, which is now sold as a prior, which is a uh, fairly potent uh, blocker. But uh, in the systemic administration, it, it shows a lot of uh, side effects. So what they have done is they want it to be exposed only in the peripheral system they inject this uh, uh, drug directly into the uh, spinal cord through epidural administration. And uh, of course, you don't need to be injecting uh, fairly often. What they have come up with is uh, pumps which can deliver the drug into the cerebrospinal fluid for uh, long durations of time, such as maybe two months or three months or longer. So it is possible to kind of either avoid the exposure to CNS or make it only exposed into CNS. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from our audience. Uh, I would like to know more about toxins acting through NOS activity. Uh, this uh, toxin was originally isolated from King Cobra venom and of course this toxin targets uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Interestingly, this molecule also exhibited uh, analgesic effect and we were after finding its uh, functional site which would uh, exhibit only uh, analgesic uh, function. And this peptide we started uh, understanding its uh, structure, function and uh, of course uh, nociceptive effect in various rodent models. And uh, during these studies, we started uh, finding that indeed it goes through uh, um, you know, opioid receptor system, but it was not directly acting on uh, morphine receptors. And uh, so we, we wanted to look at other uh, modes by which it would go, and we found out it goes through nitric oxide synthesis. And when we used L-name, it's the uh, specific inhibitor of uh, nitric oxide synthase and blocks the uh, production of nitric oxide, we could see it abrogated the uh, nociceptive effect of this antinociceptive effect of the peptide. And then subsequently, uh, we found out that the uh, ICV injection required much smaller quantities and this peptide, we believe, crosses the uh, blood brain barrier because that's where its function is most likely. And we started looking at uh, a number of these sources. And of course, in the brain, when you talk about nitric oxide synthase, uh, there is only neuronal nitric oxide synthase. And we had an opportunity to look at the uh, specific inhibitor 7NI, which is specific for neuronal nitric oxide. And when we used that, we could find that the toxin, uh, the peptide, uh, was not able to work in the presence of uh, inhibitor of neuronal nitric oxide synthase. And similarly, we had the opportunity to work with uh, N NOS knockout mice in C57 mice. And in this uh, knock knockout mice, although uh, it, it could uh, uh, exhibit uh, everything else in the background C57 mice, but in the knockout mice, our peptide did not exhibit any function, indicating that it went through neuronal nitric oxide synthase. And uh, during our uh, studies and looking at a lot of uh, receptors and ion channels in CNS through NOVA screen, we found out that it targets only nit neuronal nitric oxide synthase. And finally, we looked at the uh, uh, effect of uh, this peptide on uh, NNOS. In the test tubes, it did indeed exhibit interaction with neuronal nitric oxide synthase. 
and that's why we believe it goes through neuronal nitric oxide synthase and exhibits its analgesic effect which through the nitric oxide goes through releasing probably uh, uh, opioid peptides and through opioid receptor it exhibits its antinociceptive effect. Thank you. I'm getting a great course here this morning. Um, here's another good question. Uh, can cell-free protein expression technique be used for such, tox for such toxins? Cell-free expression technique. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you can use cell-free systems uh, to exhibit these uh, toxins. You can express these toxins uh, by any different mechanisms. The question would be whether you can fold them correctly. So to fold them correctly, you may need to go for uh, expression in uh, uh, mammalian or insect cell line or each cell line. Uh, in our lab, we use uh, E. coli for most of the uh, expression, but when you get these inclusion bodies, we try to exp you know, refold these proteins, and we have been uh, successful in getting refolding done in an in vitro situation. We are, our lab also uses yeast system as well as uh, mammalian uh, bioreactors, uh, mammalian cell culture in bioreactors to express some of these toxins. It depends on the nature of the toxin, what kind of uh, post-translational modification you need, you could use them. Of course, you can use uh, in vitro system of expression if the complexity is not so much. Lovely. We have two more questions, but we do have a couple of more minutes, so if anyone else would like to add their questions, now is the great time to do it. I'd also um, like to ask a follow-up sure. question on that. Um, since these proteins are so toxic, how do the snakes produce them without hurting themselves? <laughs> it's a very interesting question. So generally in the venom gland, the venoms are in uh, very acidic condition. The pH could be anywhere between 3.5 to 5. So when you have such a situation, it's possible that they're inactive. I mean, there are a number of toxins which are not active at such a low uh, pH. But uh, having said that, you have to remember most of the toxins are positively charged compared to most of our proteins which are n mostly acidic and negatively charged. So when you have an acidic pH, it's possible they're not fully protonated and ready with positive charges. But when they get into the victim's body or the um, you know, mouse, it's possible they, uh, they will be exposed to this neutral or uh, slightly alkaline environment. They become uh, nicely charged and go. Yeah, correct. It's, yeah, it's possible. It does work that way. So, uh, of course, there may be other mechanisms which are there, and these mechanisms have not been well characterized or studied at this point. Dr. Fritzinger, do you have an, a different perspective or additional perspective from the work that you've done on that question? Not really, because I haven't really worked with venoms. Okay. So it's, you know, what I did was really something quite different. Okay. Um, here's another question. Uh, I hope I'm going to say this word right. I would like to know how fasciator, fasciator was isolated, F-A-S-X-I-A-T-O-R. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, fasciator. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we we were looking at thank you. The fa we were looking for uh, toxins which would affect the intrinsic coagulation cascade rather than the extrinsic coagulation cascade. This is because people uh, have started finding if you block the extrinsic pathway, there is a chance that uh, you have a bleeding side effects because uh, the intrinsic pathway propagates the uh, clotting but uh, does not initiate. So they wanted the initiation to go normally and they wanted uh, to look at the intrinsic pathway. And there are a lot of evidence uh, in the literature that uh, factor 12 uh, and factor 11 uh, mutants uh, cause some problems but not severe problems of bleeding in humans and other animals. So based on that we were looking for 
toxins which would exhibit anticoagulant effect in the intrinsic pathway, but not in the extrinsic pathway. So we used a recalcification time and the uh, for the intrinsic pathway and the prothrombin time for the extrinsic pathway to distinguish these uh, types of anticoagulants. And once we found out which one was inhibiting uh, intrinsic pathway, we went uh, dissecting the uh, pathway to identify that it indeed inhibits uh, factor 11A. So that's how we were able to isolate uh, 11A specific fasciator from Bungerus fasciatus venom. Well, this is terrific. I'm going to ask just one more question, and uh, but if there are questions that have been asked and we haven't gotten to them, I'll ask uh, uh, Dr. Keeney to uh, re communicate directly with you. Um, the last, final question, what is the advantage of venom compared to small molecules regarding uh, drug development? And thank you for the talk. Uh, excellent. Uh, thank you. Excellent question. Uh, the small molecules generally tend to have micromolar affinity with the receptor and ion channels. Very rarely small molecules can have affinity of uh, nanomolar and picomolar. When I say such a thing, what that tells us is you need very small quantities of substance to get into humans. So when you have such a small quantity, the side effects are fairly limited. If you look at toxins and proteins, for example, they would recognize the receptors and ion channels at nanomolar, picomolar, and subpicomolar concentrations. I was talking uh, briefly about the thrombin inhibitor we have, and we could see uh, we could develop a thrombin inhibitor with a uh, Ki of 42 picomolar. We also have thrombin inhibitors which are one picomolar and below. So as you can see, such short molecules, small molecules, can have extremely high specificity and the cross reactivity or selectivity towards uh, the specific receptor or ion or an uh, ion channel or an enzyme would be really four to five orders of magnitude which would be tremendous when you are developing a drug. So with this I would like to thank all the people who have uh, called in and sent their questions. Thank you very much. Well, and thank you, Dr. Kinney, and thank you, Dr. Fritzinger. This has been a terrific program. Uh, thank you to everyone in our audience, and particularly to those who ask questions. It's very, very helpful. Um, I encourage you all to be in touch with us. We'll be sending you a, a note with a link to the recording for this session, and um, hopefully we'll see you in another program. Thank you so much.